Number 1. Blake Liebel lived a life of luxury in Los Angeles, California. Liebel was the son of Lorne Liebel, a sailor on the country's 1979 Olympics team and prominent real estate developer, and Eleanor Liebel, the daughter of Paul and Leona Chittle who founded Alrose Products Limited. He grew up in Toronto's Forest Hill neighborhood before moving to Los Angeles, where he lived off an allowance of $18,000 per month. Then when his mother passed away, he inherited the majority of her estate, including the lavish home in Forest Hill which he sold for $5.5 million. Online, Liebel appeared to be thriving in the bright lights of Los Angeles. He directed several episodes of the cartoon adaption of the movie, Meatballs, and he wrote, or co-wrote a number of graphic novels, and a space opera comic series. He also helped to run a publishing company that put out a comic in partnership with Wilmer Valderrama. He was married, had two young sons and the family lived in Beverly Hills. However, despite the fact that he seemed successful, Liebel had practically no income from his endeavors and depended on his father to pay his credit card bills. In 2015, he filed for divorce and shortly thereafter, his new girlfriend, Ian Cajun, fell pregnant. In 2010, Liebel created the graphic novel Syndrome. The plot follows a doctor's quest to isolate the root of evil in the brain and tries his experiment out on a serial killer. In a case of life imitating art, Liebel would later brutally murder Cajun in a crime which was said to follow a script from the graphic novel. Cajun was born in Ukraine and lived in Kiev until her late twenties. She studied law in college and worked in tax inspection. In 2014, she moved to Los Angeles on a student visa. It was here that she met and started to date Liebel. Just the week before Cajun's murder, Liebel had been charged with felony rape, but was out on $100.00 bail. His victim was not Cajun, but when she found out, she moved out of their apartment and moved in with her mother, who was visiting from Ukraine, to help with the couple's newborn baby, Diana. In May of 2016, Cajun returned to the apartment to speak with Liebel. When she didn't come back to her mother's apartment or call her to let her know she was staying with Liebel, her mother reported her missing, prompting police to pay a visit to the couple's apartment in the 8500 block of Holloway Drive. As they arrived at the scene, Liebel barricaded himself in by placing bedding and furniture at the door. Ultimately, he came out real peacefully and gave himself up, said Lt. David Coleman. Upon entering the dimly lit apartment, it was clear why Liebel hadn't wanted them to come in. In a blood-spattered bedroom, police found the body of 30-year-old Cajun lying on a blood-stained mattress with a Mickey Mouse comforter. Diana was found beside her mother's body, unharmed. Cajun's autopsy painted a terrifying picture of the pain and terror she had endured. Her blood had been completely drained, her head was scalped, and her eyebrows and right ear had been cut off. There were several bite marks on her jaw. Ultimately, she died from blunt force trauma to the skull and exsanguination. The pathologist noted that Cajun had survived for at least eight hours after receiving the scalp injury. I have never seen this before. And I doubt if hardly any forensic pathologists in this county or abroad have even seen this outside of, perhaps, wartime, he said. Liebel appeared in court several days later. He was wearing a sleeveless padded suicide jacket and pleaded not guilty. He was arraigned on charges of mayhem, aggravated mayhem, torture, and murder. As defined by the California Criminal Code, mayhem includes disfigurement or dismemberment, while aggravated mayhem is defined as showing extreme indifference to the physical or psychological well-being of another person by causing permanent disability or disfigurement. His lawyer, Alala Cameron, questioned whether her was mentally competent to stand trial. Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Keith Schwartz ordered Liebel to undergo psychological evaluation. Liebel would be ruled competent, and the trial was scheduled for 2018. During Liebel's trial, graphic photographs of the crime scene were shown. In his testimony, Sergeant William Cotter pointed out bloodstains on drapes, on a headboard, on a lamp. He also showed a piece of flesh on the bedding and Cajun's lifeless and naked body. She was scalped, bruised and missing her eyebrows and right ear. The pathologist, Jonathan Lucas, said, basically her scalp is missing form the top of her head. There's an absence of tissue, we were looking directly at bone. 
He also testified, the Cajun was still alive while being mutilated. As for a motivation, the prosecution argued that Liebel was jealous of the attention that Cajun was paying to their newborn daughter. Cajun's mother, old Cajun, read out an impact statement. He took away the most precious thing that a baby could have. This monster ruined our lives, ruined the lives of his family, lives of his sons, of his newborn daughter who looks like him, like a spitting copy. At the time of the trial, Cajun's daughter was living with her family back in Ukraine. Blake Liebel was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In imposing the life sentence, Judge Mark Wyndham said that the case was unusual due to the savagery, the defendant's profound brutality and his inconceivable cruelty. The prosecution had opted not to seek the death penalty because Liebel didn't have a prior criminal record, but also because of the massive backlog of inmates waiting to be executed in California. We seek death in, you know, relatively few cases. Given the fact that nobody's been put to death in over a decade, and there's 740-something on death row right now, said Deputy District Attorney Beth Silverman. In February of 2019, a California judge ordered Liebel to pay the family of Cajun $42 million. This murder didn't just kill one person, it really did kill the family, it shattered the family. And the family has had a hard time crawling back from this, said Jake Finkel, an attorney representing Cajun's family. Number 2. Stephanie Roper was a student at the Frostburg State University in Maryland. She had her whole life ahead of her, but unfortunately, Stephanie was killed when she was only 22 years old. This story takes place on April 3, 1982. Stephanie had spent the evening with her friends, and her car broke down on her way home. Even though it was late at night, and it was dark, two men happened to drive by. They stopped their vehicle and offered to help Stephanie, and give her a ride. As soon as Stephanie stepped into their car, they pulled out firearms and drove away to an abandoned house. Stephanie was tortured and raped by her captors, and some time during this ordeal, one of the men accidentally said his accomplice's name out loud. The two men were afraid that Stephanie now could identify them and decided to kill her. They shot Stephanie and tried to make it impossible to identify her by severing her hands and burning her corpse. It did not take the authorities long to arrest the two ex-cons, as Beatty made it easy, by bragging about his exploits. Both men were charged with felony murder, rape, and kidnapping. Both were convicted and given two concurrent life sentences with the possibility of parole after 12 years. This minimum of 12 years was later doubled when additional time was added to their original sentences, a second consecutive life sentence for Jones, and an additional 20 years for Beatty, to be served after his first life sentence. Beatty is still incarcerated, as of this writing, while Jones is reported to have killed himself in prison, as reported by Roper's mother, a justice advocate, in 2012. While Roper's last words were recounted during the trial by Beatty, the frightened co-ed begged for her life and tried to talk her way into an early release, more people would rather remember Roper's final diary entry, which read, Every person can make a difference, and every person should try. In 2002, Roper's name was lent to the Maryland Crime Victims Resource Center, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting crime victims and their families in the old line state. Number 3. Kelly Ann Bates was dating a man, three times her age. She told her parents about it, moved in with him, and never saw her family again. A few months after she moved out her boyfriend told the police that his girlfriend Kelly Ann Bates had accidentally drowned, but what they found in the house would torment the family for the rest of their lives. Smith had a history of abuse with the girls he'd been in a relationship with, he had become more abusive with each girl, he was a ticking time bomb waiting to go off, and with Kelly Ann Bates, he finally killed someone. Kelly Ann Bates was 16 years old when she gathered her parents in the kitchen to tell them something very special. Unknowingly to her mother, Kelly brought her boyfriend home for the first time. She informed her parents that she had been in a relationship for two years and that her boyfriend was 32 years old. James Patterson entered the room after she informed her parents about her boyfriend. Kelly's mother, Margaret, was taken aback when she learned of Smith's age, which was twice that of her daughter. She noticed something off about him right away. He didn't look like a 32-year-old man at first, and he seemed to be much older. 
Kelly told her family that she and her boyfriend had been together for two years. The couple met in 1993, when Kelly was just 14 years old. They were able to keep their relationship a secret from their families until she eventually summoned the courage to tell them about it. Margaret searched around for more details about her daughter's boyfriend, but came up empty-handed, because she asked if anyone knew 32-year-old James Patterson Smith, who was actually 49 years old, 33 years older than Kelly. Kelly Ann Bates never imagined that the guy she hoped would be the ideal boyfriend would take her life a few months later as she stood in the kitchen telling her family about her 32-year-old boyfriend. Kelly was now an adult, and her parents couldn't stop her from seeing her boyfriend. But Margaret later admitted in an interview that she just wanted to stab him with the bread knife in the kitchen. She regretted not doing that at the time, saying, This wasn't the man I wanted for my daughter. I vividly recall seeing our bread knife in the kitchen and wanting to pick it up and stab him in the back. Kelly was 16 at the time, and in Britain she was an adult. Her parents could not force her to stay away from her boyfriend, although she didn't know what's best for her. Soon after the meeting in the kitchen, on November 30, 1995, Kelly left her family home and moved south to live with her unemployed boyfriend. She did not visit her family and spoke to them on the phone most of the time. Margaret was worried from the beginning, she wanted to go to the police, but Kelly was too old for the police to do anything, and she didn't listen to her mother. I didn't know what to do. She was too old for the police to do anything. She wouldn't listen to me. During their relationship, Kelly and Smith broke up for a while, but then Smith stalked her until they were back again. While trips to Smith's house were common for Kelly, her parents followed her to Smith's house. While there Smith invited them into his house and showed them a hole in the floorboards that he said had been made by engineers repairing a gas leak, Kelly's parents believe that this was the place where he held Kelly Ann Bates captive. Her parents agreed only on one condition that she keeps in regular contact and keeps coming to their home. But soon after she moved out, she stopped visiting the family, and when she stopped by for a rare visit, her parents noticed bruises on her arms. Soon Margaret and Tammy had enough of Kelly not visiting her home for several days and wanted to meet her to see how she was doing. As they were about to leave, however, their oldest son returned home and told her that one of his friends had seen Kelly Ann Bates and that she was fine. Margaret was so happy to learn that her daughter was doing well that she forgot to ask when he last saw her. What time was it? She would be protected from her boyfriend's barbaric torment if they went to check on her. Kelly soon stopped seeing her relatives, fearful that her parents would find out about the bruises. Over the holidays, she avoided giving them visits. On March 10, 1996, Margaret called Kelly to inform her that she had missed a dentist appointment. That would be the last time they spoke to each other. Kelly promised she would come home to visit the family on Mother's Day the next Sunday, but she never did. Margaret instead received a card from Kelly, but it was not written in Kelly's handwriting. At Kelly's father's birthday and her parents' wedding anniversary, they witnessed the similarity. They knew something was wrong at that point, but Kelly Ann Bates was murdered before they could intervene. Kelly was subjected to horrific torment in the weeks leading up to her death, while her family waited by the phone. Patterson has a history of mistreating the people with whom he shared a home. His first marriage ended in divorce after he continued to hit his pregnant wife and other women who dated James Patterson Smith shared similar accounts. He was no different to Kelly Ann Bates, but instead escalated the abuse to a frightening new level. All of this was revealed on April 16, 1996, when Smith went to the Gordon police station and said he had inadvertently killed Kelly Ann Bates while she was lying in a bathtub, drowning her. When authorities discovered Kelly Ann Bates in the home, however, the truth was revealed. They saw a very different story. Kelly was held prisoner for four weeks by the monster, who scalded her, crushed her arms and legs, gouged her eyes up to three weeks before her death, stabbed her entire body with knives, forks, and scissors, and stamped her with a domestic iron, resulting in 150 different injuries all over her body. 
Kelly was then struck with a showerhead before being drowned. The case went to trial, and prosecutors outlined the torture the girl suffered until she died, with one prosecutor telling the jury that the girl's physical pain would have been intense, causing anguish and torment to the point of mental breakdown and collapse. Women who had been abused by Smith came forward during the trial to tell the court what he had done to them. Even after torturing Kelly Ann Bates for hours on end, Smith insisted in court that he was the true victim. Kelly, he said, had provoked him to kill her by taunting him about his mother's death. He said she inflicted her own injuries on him to make him look bad. On November 19, 1997, the jury found James Patterson Smith, 49, guilty of the murder of Kelly Ann Bates and sentenced him to a minimum of 20 years in jail, where he is still serving. As for Margaret, she wishes, I want him to die just like Kelly did. I know I shouldn't say this, but I wish I'd killed him the first time I saw him. That way Kelly would still be alive.